perfect. And, and I see Rafa has just joined us as well, so perfect time. Great. So hi, everyone. My name is uh, Marcus Salvatore. I'm an anesthesiologist at Toronto General Hospital with an interest in adult congenital heart disease. I'd like to thank you all for attending today and also like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present about one of my passions. So Raphael and Fabio, they really deserve an incredible amount of recognition for creating and organizing these multi-center echo rounds, which provide a truly unique opportunity to learn from each other and compare notes between centers. So the topic of today's talk is TEE for adult congenital heart disease. I have no disclosures or competing interests, but what I do have a lot of is acknowledgements. So I'm truly fortunate to work in an amazing center with exposure to these incredible cases. And they really make every day both fascinating and challenging. I wanna thank my mentors in anesthesia listed on the left, as well as the members of the Toronto Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program who have been so welcoming and supportive since I've joined the team. The director of the ACHD program is Dr. Rafa Alonzo, a cardiologist who specializes in heart failure and echocardiography for adults with congenital heart disease. He joins us on this call today to answer questions and to provide valuable insights. Also joining us is Dr. Ahmad Omran, consultant cardiologist and inter international expert in transesophageal echocardiography. I'd like to highlight some of the resources used, including the 3D models provided by Dr. Azad Mashari and the Lynn and Arnold Irwin Perioperative Imaging Lab. Also a bit of promo for two texts that have been authored here at Toronto General Hospital, Perioperative 2D TEE by Dr. Annette Vegas, as well as the Cardiac Anesthesia Handbook by Dr. Vegas and myself. The sources for any images used are listed at the end of the presentation. So the topic of today's multi-center echo rounds is adult congenital heart disease. Now, not everyone is going to work at a center that performs elective cardiac surgery for congenital patients. However, the number of adults with congenital heart disease is growing exponentially as a result of the rapid progress made in terms of both surgical corrections and medical management. Many centers today routinely manage congenital patients for non-cardiac surgery, and you may be called upon to perform a diagnostic or rescue TEE in these cases should an unanticipated instability occur. So it is important to have a basic understanding and practical approach so that you can interpret the TEE images for these patients. Needless to say, it is incredibly ambitious and really impossible to even scratch the surface of congenital TEE in 60 minutes. So today is very much an introduction. Interpretation of congenital TEE is dependent upon a robust understanding of normal cardiac chamber anatomy and relationships. So this is just as much a lecture on cardiac fundamentals as it is about congenital heart disease. Using the framework outlined by the Van Prague sequential segmental approach, we will learn how to identify the orientation and position of the heart within the chest, how to differentiate cardiac chambers by their unique morphological characteristics, how to determine the connections between those chambers, and then how to integrate this information for clinical interpretation. When giving a lecture, I think it's just as important to define the boundaries of what's not covered, especially as our cardiac fellows are beginning to prepare for the APT exam in five months time. So we won't be discussing guideline recommendations, although I've listed them here to direct your independent study. We also won't be discussing systems of annotation or classification, which you likely won't need for the exam. Due to time constraints, we won't be reviewing intracardiac shunts or hemodynamic calculations but I think that these are important topics both for the exam and everyday clinical practice. Finally, we will not be discussing the evaluation of surgical corrections. Depending on your feedback, these will all be potential topics for future iterations of this lecture in years to come. So when faced with a congenital patient, the complexity at first can be overwhelming for a variety of reasons. First of all, the sheer number of variations and combinations of abnormalities can seem infinite. To add another layer of complexity, there are multiple systems of nomenclature and classification, as well as eponymous disease and procedure names completely unrelated to the underlying anatomy. When you do actually perform a TEE, you will sometimes find atypical images at unconventional angles, owing to differences in structure, morphology, connections, shunts, and corrections. The key to simplifying this complexity is to disassemble the heart into its component parts or segments, 
and then to apply a standardized sequential approach to image interpretation. Unlike a TEE for a normal heart, the standard 28 views may not tell the whole story, but chambers and connections always do. Ultimately, the goal of this talk is to teach you a standardized approach to TEE for congenital patients. By the end of the talk, you will be able to make sense of complex images like these. However, an important disclaimer, should you need to manage a congenital patient in your practice, it is critically important to one, first understand the anatomy, including any prior surgeries, and two, involve expert congenital cardiologists who have more experience interpreting these images. We routinely call Dr. Alonzo down to the OR to help us with interpret interpretation during our most complex cases. And that integrated team-based approach is integral to our success at TGH. The sequential segmental approach to congenital heart disease was developed by the Van Prags in the late 1970s. And it is the system of convention used throughout North America. The cardiac anatomy is assessed first by dividing the heart into three distinct segments the atria, the ventricles, and the arterial trunks. Various sources divide the approach into different number of steps, but the principles remain the same. The approach begins by first determining the position and orientation of the heart within the chest. In step two, we identify the situs or sidedness of the heart chambers, which is determined by the position of the right atrium. Next, we use intrinsic, morphological characteristics to identify the various heart chambers regardless of their position. Once the chambers are identified, we can more easily determine the connections between them, including any shunts. So step one is position and orientation. Position and orientation are independent features which can occur in various combinations. Cardiac position or displacement describes the location of the heart within the chest. Unlike all of the other cardiac features discussed today, cardiac position is not necessarily an intrinsic feature of a patient's anatomy and may be influenced by extrinsic forces. Many of you would have had the experience of trying to perform a TEE in patients with altered cardiac position due to lateral decubitus positioning or a large hemothorax. Cardiac position is not often diagnosed with echocardiography but is more easily assessed using other radiographic techniques, such as simple chest x-ray. The typical cardiac station in the left side of the chest is termed level position. Mesoposition, when the heart appears in the middle of the chest, is sometimes seen in patients with severe COPD and hyperinflation. Finally, dextroposition may occur as a result of a compressive left hemothorax, severe scoliosis, or right lung collapse but may also occur as part of a congenital cardiac condition, such as dextrocardia, which is a term that describes cardiac orientation. Orientation describes the base to apex axis of the heart as determined by the position of the cardiac apex. The three possibilities are levocardia, mesocardia, and dextrocardia, as shown here on the right side of the screen. Although orientation and position are not always interconnected, certain congenital combinations are more likely than others. For example, dextrocardia is often associated with dextroposition as we will see in the upcoming slides. So here are two clips from two different patients, each with a diagnosis of dextrocardia. I can tell you that both also have a diagnosis of dextroposition, but as you can see, that doesn't really impact our ability to get reasonable metasophageal four chamber views at zero degrees with some minor adjustments in probe rotation. Both clips clearly show a four chamber heart oriented with the apex to the patient's right, contrary to the conventional orientation. Displayed here are a series of chest X-rays and CTs showing various combinations of cardiac position and orientation. Starting with number one, we see the heart in the left side of the chest and the apex pointing toward the patient's left. This is the nearly universal arrangement of level position and level cardia. Number two is not much different, showing a midline heart with mesoposition and mesocardia, which may represent a normal variant. 
three, four, and five all show dextral position, meaning that the heart is in the right side of the chest, although the specifics vary between cases. Three and four both show a heart with the apex pointed towards the patient's right, representing dextrocardia. Three shows dextrocardia with situs solidus, or normal chamber arrangement, while four shows dextrocardia with situs inversus, or inversion of heart chambers relative to their normal arrangement. An early hint to the situs inversus in patient four is the gastric bubble, which also appears on the patient's right-hand side, indicating situs inversus totalis, affecting all thoracic and abdominal organs. Finally, number five shows the combination of dextral position and levocardia, which might occur in the context of a pneumothorax or following right pneumonectomy. These examples provide a good segue to step two of the segmental approach, which is determining the situs or sidedness of the heart chambers. Although situs technically translates from the Latin to site or position, it is often easier to conceptualize situs as referring to the arrangement of various organs, chambers, and structures. As echocardiographers, you would have most often heard this term situs in relation to the heart, but situs is also an innate characteristic of the lungs and abdominal organs. Situs solidus means in the original arrangement. For the heart, this is determined by the position of the morphological right atrium, independent from cardiac position orientation, or relationship to ventricles and blood vessels. Pulmonary situs refers to the sidedness of the morphological right and left lungs, as defined by characteristics such as the number of lobes and the relationship of the pulmonary arteries to their bronchi. Finally, abdominal situs refers to the position of the abdominal organs, such as the liver and stomach within the abdomen. The term situs inversus can be best thought of as a flipped image of the natural arrangement. For example, when you look at the heart CT on this slide, you come to appreciate that rotating the heart around a single axis could never yield the inversus image. Instead, the heart appears mirrored or transposed across a sagittal plane. As several of the thoracic and abdominal organs share the same embryological origins, the situs of the different organ systems often correlate in a phenomenon called visceroatrial concordance. This means that in the majority of cases, the situs of the right atrium, and thus the heart, will correlate with the sidedness of the lungs and abdominal organs, which can help you when interpreting TEE images. But as with all things in congenital heart disease, there are exceptions to every rule, and there exist rare patients in which the situs of the organ systems cannot be accurately determined. This arrangement is termed heterotaxy or situs ambiguous. As we see here, there's a patient with a broad liver that spans the entire abdomen, in addition to a right-sided stomach and polysplenism. This often occurs in the context of cardiac isomerism in which the atria are mirrored, resulting in a patient with two right or left atria. All right, so you insert your TEE probe and you see this patient has cleared dextrocardia. How do you go about determining the situs of this patient? Well, this requires you to identify the various chambers according to their innate morphological characteristics. Now, this isn't always easy or straightforward, but you would be surprised with how much you can infer from subtle details. For instance, in clip one, the atrioventricular valve here is apically displaced relative to the other side. Secondly, although the appendages cannot be identified, the atrial chamber here appears to contain a septum secundum. These are both features that you would associate with right-sided structures, although they appear on the left side of the heart in this case. Now, there are also features are, that are unreliable as identifiers and may serve as red herrings. For example, in this colored, colored Doppler image, the chamber at the top of the screen appears to have at least two tributary vessels. Colored Doppler reveals the flow to be laminar, pulsatile, and directed towards the AV valve. The lateral orientation of these vessels at zero degrees 
suggests that they are more likely to be pulmonary veins than cava. There is no eustachian or Thebesian valves visible. Pulse wave Doppler reveals pulmonary vein flow. However, the pulmonary veins serve as unreliable landmarks, owing to phenomena such as anomalous venous drainage. But together, these findings suggest that this patient has dextrocardia with situs inversus. These veins are the left upper and lower pulmonary veins as they originate from the morphological left lung, situated in the right side of the chest. I find it interesting that despite the situs inversus of this heart, the morphological left atrium still serves as the echocardiographic window to the heart. These next two clips are from the same patient. In the previous slides, we determined that we are looking at the heart through the morphological left atrium. We recognize the intraatrial septum here, which suggests that the chamber on the bottom of the screen is the right atrium, further supported by the visible septum secundum. Regardless of cardiac position, orientation, or situs, we know that around 90 degrees, the right side of the screen is oriented cranially, suggesting that this vessel is the SVC, further confirmed by the tip of the central line. The transgastric view shows additional findings, including inverted ventricular anatomy, as well as a left-sided liver, indicating that this patient has situs inversus totalis, affecting all major organs. So what can we do if we suspect dextrocardia, but the defining chamber characteristics are not clear? For example, in this patient, the AV valves appear to originate at roughly the same level. There is no clear moderator band, and the septum secundum cannot be visualized. So what can we do? Well, an agitated saline study leaves little doubt that the left side of the heart is the chamber that receives the systemic venous return. So this highlights the next step of the algorithm, which, to, which is to identify cardiac chambers according to intrinsic morphological characteristics, regardless of their position within the heart or relative to other chambers. So let's let, first look at the atria. The defining landmark of the right atrium is the broad-based triangular appendage, characterized by extensive pectinate muscles throughout. The second landmark is the crista terminalis, often seen between the SVC and the right atrial appendage, best appreciated in the bicable view. The inflow to the right atrium includes the superior, superior and inferior vena cava, as well as the coronary sinus. However, only the IVC can be used as an identifier for the right atrium, owing to conditions such as anomalous caval venous return or unroofed coronary sinus. The intraatrial septum also has distinguishing features with the septum secundum seen on the right atrial side. In contrast, the left atrial appendage is a smooth finger-like projection with a narrow opening. Pulmonary veins are variable in congenital disease and are therefore unreliable as chamber identifiers. There is no crista terminalis and the IAS is characterized by the septum primum. Lastly, it is important to note that the atrial ventricular valves should be conceptualized as ventricular structures and do not help when distinguishing the atria. These clips taken from a normal heart highlight these differences. Clip, show, clip one shows the key right atrial identifiers, including the broad based right atrial appendage, the crista terminalis, and the septum secundum. Clip two shows the narrow finger-like atrial appendage. Needless to say, not all patients will have such clearly defined atria, especially amongst adults with congenital heart disease. This clip, for instance, shows a bicaval view in a patient with a sinus venosus ASD. What you can see here is an intraatrial communication caused by a deficiency of the common wall between the superior vena cava and the right-sided pulmonary veins. On color Doppler, we can appreciate two distinct flows, blue flow through the ASD and red flow from the right middle and upper pulmonary veins into the SVC. Traditionally, these defects were repaired using the Warden procedure, 
in which the SVC is detached and reconnected to the right atrial appendage. However, these days, it is much more common for surgeons to perform a double patch repair. One patch is used to divide the SVC, creating a baffle that reroutes the anomalous pulmonary vein flow through the existing ASD into the LA. A second patch is used to enlarge the SVC to provide unimpeded drainage. Once the right atrium is identified, the situs of the heart can be established. As mentioned, patients may rarely exhibit a mirroring of their left or right atrium in a condition called isomerism. Isomerism is associated with heterotaxy or situs ambiguous of the lungs and abdominal organs. Now that we have identified the atria, we can move on to identifying the ventricles. The right ventricle will always be associated with a tricuspid atrial ventricular valve with a more apical point of attachment. The septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve tethers to the septum, as opposed to mitral cordae, which tether to the ventricular apex. The infundibular RVOT conus is part of the characteristic shape of the RV seen in the standard metesophageal RV inflow outflow view. Coarse trabeculations are seen throughout the RV and the moderator band will often be appreciated at the apex. In contrast, the LV is connected to a semilunar valve with a more basal point of attachment. There is fibrous continuity between the aortic and mitral valves, often called the aortomitral curtain. Other distinguishing features include an absence of cordae tethering the valve to the septum and the absence of a moderator band. However, false tendons may be mistaken for a moderator band in some patients. These clips demonstrate how morphological features can be used to identify the ventricles. We see here a heart in situs solidus, as indicated by the central line seen in the right atrium. However, the ventricular architecture appears grossly abnormal. The ventricle on the left side of the heart is dilated and hypertrophic with what appears to be a moderator band at the apex. There is an apically displaced atrioventricular valve with severe regurgitation. Closer inspection of the left-sided AV valve shows that the medial leaflet tethers to the septum here. Together, these findings suggest that the ventricle on the left side of the heart is the morphological right ventricle. In the context of normal situs, we can deduce that this patient has ventricular inversion, otherwise known as congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries. The apical displacement of the tricuspid valve is accentuated in this patient with epstenoid valve characteristics. Correctly identifying the ventricular morphology is even more challenging when there's only a single ventricle and single atrial ventricular valve as comparisons across chambers cannot be made. Here we see a congenital patient with a large common atrium and a common inlet into a single ventricle. But is this the left or the right ventricle? Well, the moderator band and septal tethering identify this as the systemic right ventricle in a patient with a history of hypoplastic left heart. The final chambers to identify morphologically are the arterial trunks. They are simple structures without many defining features, and we must rely on connections and branch vessels to discern them. The pulmonary artery bifurcates into the right and left PAs, whereas the aorta has coronary arteries proximally and the head vessels that extend from the arch. In some patients, the PA and aorta are combined and form a single vessel called the truncus arteriosus. Truncus arteriosus is an uncommon congenital abnormality that occurs due to the failure of conotruncal separation during development of the fetus. It is characterized by a single arterial trunk that originates from the heart and supplies the systemic, pulmonary, and coronary circulations. Although there are many different manifestations and classification systems, there are two broad categories common trunks in which both the PA and aorta originate at the level of the truncal valve, 
and solitary trunks in which the right and left pulmonary arteries arise independent from the valve distally along the truncus. Here is the metesophageal long axis view of a patient with truncus arteriosus and a large VSD. Both the right and left ventricles can be seen emptying into a large solitary truncus. Imaging the descending thoracic aorta reveals the branch points for the pulmonary arteries, which come directly off the aorta, just distal to the left subclavian artery. Now that we have identified each of the chambers and their arrangement, we can complete the final step of the segmental approach, which is defining the essential connections, thereby determining the direction of blood flow. The two main connections to discern are the atrioventricular connections and the ventriculoarterial arterial connections. Let's begin with the connection between the atria and ventricles. The three main types of atrioventricular connections are concordant, discordant, and univentricular. As we have already learned, the situs of the heart is determined by the position of the right atrium, independent of the arrangement of all the other chambers. AV concordance is determined by which ventricle connects to the right atrium with the four possible combinations shown here. Univentricular AV connections can occur due to a number of different congenital abnormalities, such as pulmonary atresia, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, or large VSDs. These are often palliated into single ventricle or Fontan physiology. Unfortunately, the various types of Fontan, although fascinating, are beyond the scope of this talk. The three types of univentricular connection, connections shown here are termed single inlet, double inlet, or common inlet. Here we have clips from a 20-year-old patient with a univentricular AV connection. We can see that he has one large common atrium that empties into a single systemic right ventricle through a common AV valve or inlet. The 3D image on the right shows the thickened tri-leaflet common AV valve from the atrial side. We can follow the infundibular conus to the truncal valve, which opens to a dilated solitary trunk. Colored Doppler of the truncal valve shows significant regurgitation, which was the indication for surgery. Approximately 30% of patients with truncus arteriosus will have quadricuspid truncal valves with su successful repairs well documented in the literature. This clip shows another type of univentricular connection, termed a double inlet left ventricle. Here, there are two distinct atrioventricular valves, both of which common, sorry, both of which open to a common systemic left ventricle. Also near the right atrium are other features of his palliative repair, including a lateral Fontan conduit and an intraatrial baffle. Abnormalities may also arise at the ventriculo arterial connections, also termed the ventricular outlet. The most characteristic lesion of this type is transposition of the great arteries, or TGA, which exists in two main forms. LTGA and DTGA. In the schematics shown here, gray denotes native connections and chamber orientation, whereas yellow indicates abnormalities. LTGA here is also co called congenitally corrected transposition. In these patients, the connections between the atria and ventricles, as well as between the ventricles and great arteries are both discordant. Compared to a normal heart, only the ventricles have changed their position. Understanding the physiology helps to clarify some of the alternative names for this condition, including ventricular inversion and double discordance. Although the connections are discordant, blood follows a normal route through the lungs, heart, and systemic circulation. However, the systemic RV will eventually fail as a result of a lifetime of systemic pressures. Conversely, patients with DTGA 
on the right side of the screen only have a single discordant connection between the ventricles and great arteries. And it is the aorta and the PA that are inverted. Physio physiologically, this represents a much more abnormal configuration as venous blood returns to the systemic circulation without passing through the lungs. This is therefore a form of ductal dependent cyanotic heart disease, which requires corrective surgery soon after birth, most commonly an, atrial, oh, sorry, an arterial switch. Here are clips from a 21-year-old patient with LTGA admitted to hospital with a first presentation of a symptomatic tachyarrhythmia. This was a TEE performed to rule out thrombus before cardioversion. Although the first clip does not show the features necessary to determine situs, the, so, the slow sweep of clip two shows that the left atrium is on the left side of the heart. Using morphological identifiers, we can see that there is a discordant AV connection as the left atrium is connected to a morphological RV. So we've identified this as left atrium with left atrial appendage and is connected to morphological RV with moderator band and septal tether. The ventricles are thus inverted and the morphological RV is the systemic ventricle. Due to differences in contraction mechanics and chamber architecture, the systemic right ventricle fails early in life as evidenced here by RV hypertrophy, dilatation, and hypokinesis. Conversely, patients with DTGA will have undergone early corrective procedures which must be clarified in order to understand and interpret images correctly. There are some key echocardiographic findings in these patients which are easily recognized. First, as demonstrated in this clip, the left and right AV valves attach at the same level and don't show the apical septal attachment of the tricuspid valve leaflet that we previously used to identify the morphological RV. In the normal heart, the position of the pulmonic valve relative to the aortic valve can rem be remembered using the neuronic PALS or PALS, as the pulmonic valve is normally anterior, lateral, and superior to the aortic valve. However, in DTGA, the aortic valve lies anterior to the pulmonic valve as seen in these images. So in this image, this is your pulmonic valve, and this is your aortic valve. Same thing here, pulmonic valve, aortic valve, and this is different than obviously what you'd expect to see in a short axis view. Due to this abnormal chamber arrangement, the aortic and pulmonic valves are coplanar and can be imaged together in either short or long axis. Here is a second patient with DTGA complicated by complex intracardiac anatomy, which precluded full repair. She also had valvular pulmonary stenosis, and so her pulmonary artery was disconnected and attached to her SVC. Here we see the coplanar aortic and pulmonary valves, the anterior position of the aortic valve, and the ligated pulmonary artery. So here's aortic valve. This is her hypoplastic pulmonic valve, ligated pulmonary artery. And in the deep transgastric view, we can see the same aortic valve, hypoplastic pulmonic valve ligated pulmonary artery. Although I won't delve too deeply into surgical repairs, understanding the corrective options possible for DTGA further highlights the physiology of this congenital disease. Surgical corrections attempt to reapproximate the normal flow of blood through the heart. Early corrective strategies accomplish this goal by switching the venous inflow to the atria using baffles in a procedure called an, an atrial switch or mustard procedure. Switching the atria adds a second discordant connection here, which diverts venous return through the LA to the LV and out to the lungs. Oxygen, oxygenated blood returns to the RA via a baffle, traveling through the RV to the systemic circulation. In this way, surgeons recreate the congenital correction found in patients with LTGA. However, this procedure leaves the patient with a systemic right ventricle, which as we discussed, will fail over time. 
Baffle leaks and atrial dilatation are also common complications. So this procedure is no longer performed. These days, DTGA is repaired by correct, by, sorry, is repaired by correcting the sole discordant connection between the ventricles and great arteries, thereby restoring conventional blood flow to the heart. This procedure is called the arterial switch or Jatin procedure, as illustrated in this diagram on the right. These clips show a 43-year-old patient with DD, DTGA status post-atrial switch procedure. Clip one shows a mid-esophageal four-chamber view with a pacer wire extending through, sorry, into the LA through the atrial baffle, and that's right here. You can also appreciate the dilated hypokinetic and hypertrophied systemic right ventricle. The color Doppler in clip two shows the pulmonary venous blood returning to the right atrium via an atrial baffle. And so this brings us to the end of our presentation. There are a few key takeaways I would like to reiterate. The ACHD population is rapidly growing due to advances in surgical technique and medical management. You may be required to manage these patients outside of tertiary referral centers. TEE imaging of patients with ACHD begins with a thorough understanding of the patient's anatomy and prior surgical corrections. Complex studies can be simplified using a sequential segmental approach. Identify each chamber using morphological features, then define the connections between them. These are the sources for the various figures. And thank you for your attention. I would like to now open the floor to any questions with the help of Dr. Rafa Alonso, Medical Director of the ACHD program at TGH, as well as Dr. Ahmad Omran, Consultant Cardiologist. So Raphael, we'll direct to you. I'm gonna stop sharing screen and, and I'll let you uh, take over as host. Is that okay? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, for the great talk, Marcus, and uh, appreciate all the effort you put to make uh, your presentation outstanding. Um, I don't see any questions on our chat. So uh, I have a question, but to ask my question, as I already talked to you beforehand, um, Marcus, I'd like to discuss a case and then hear uh, the expert's uh, opinion. Uh, Raphael. Yes. Um, someone had uh, put the hands up. I think it's Arnold. Arnold, did you put the hand up? Um, yes, I, I do put the hands up. I have a uh, first, of all, first of all, I want to say congratulations to Marcus. Really great presentation. It's such a complicated topic, and having a good uh, approach can is really helpful to assess those type of patient. My question is regarding the use of 3D printing technology in understanding the anatomy and the physiology of this patient prior to the surgery. Are you guys are using this type of technology at TGH before the surgery to kind of program the, uh, the surgery, the approach of, of the case? Right, so I know this is the work of a lot in the APA lab are really working, making uh, you know huge strides in terms of integrating the CT data into 3D printed models so that the surgeons and uh, congenital cardiologists can uh, both together look at it in a 3D space and plan their surgery a little bit uh, better. Uh, Rafa, do you have uh, any experience with uh, when a 3D model really uh, facilitated or helped the surgeons in terms of their approach? So, so we do, we do use it in co very complex patients where the anatomy is not clear or, or where, where that, mainly when we cannot find exactly where the holes are, when we want to close uh, more for, for percutaneous procedures than for, for surgical procedures. But uh, we have the possibility of, uh, of creating a 3D printing model that mainly use with very complex cases when, when the imaging alone doesn't allow us to see exactly where the, the problem is. But we, we, it's very, it's more common for, for, for percutaneous procedures than for surgical procedures. But we have the option to use it for surgery if we need it. And then, Rafael, just before moving on to the, the next case, I think you wanted to touch briefly upon uh, ca cases of salvage ECMO or rescue ECMO in congenital patients. Do you want to talk briefly about that? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I, I was wondering if you, uh, 
experts could give us any uh, recommendation or at least uh, uh, stepwise approach in the case that we uh, oftentimes we are requested to do a TE for ECMO uh, insertion and uh, could be salvage or even uh, more of an elective. And uh, I was wondering if you could give us any um, rationale on when or how to think to consider about to consider any uh, congenital heart disease if the ECMO uh, is not working properly. Um, just in general approach for troubleshooting ECMO and when and how to consider congenital disease. Uh, again, Rafa, do you have any experience? I haven't personally seen uh, ECMO in, in a congenital patient. I know there were two that we were discussing it for. There was a recent Epstein's that had an extremely dilated uh, RV, 480 mils, and we were talking about temporary centromag support in order to uh, support the RV, but in, in the end, he didn't end up needing it. And then the other conversation that we had regarding uh, was VV ECMO in a Fontan patient that developed uh, early pneumonia and ARDS following surgery. So those are the two that come to mind. Uh, uh, Rafa, and, and any other experience that you have recently in terms of uh, ECMO use for congenital patients? So if we exclude from the, from the, if we exclude the patients with single ventricle and frontal physiology, which are extremely complex and, uh, and that would need a, uh, uh, I, um, I talk themselves because actually each patient is different and the cannulation depends on the configuration of the fronta. If we talk about the any biventricular uh, patient with biventricular heart, regardless of the ventricle systemic RV or systemic LV, ECMO tra troubleshooting problems should not be different than a patient with biventricular heart. So normally uh, we haven't had, as Marco said, anybody recent, we have somebody now in the unit, but, but uh, but having had a, a, a case recently, and we discussed those as a pre-op, when we have a patient high risk, we discussed pre-op who might need ECMO. But in terms of managing a patient with biventricular heart, whether or not has congenital heart disease, sometimes the people, because the patient has congenital heart disease, acts differently. But if the patient has a fallout with an RV failure, it's not different than in terms of ECMO management than a patient with with a RV failure for another reason, with a severe uh, pulmonary uh, embolism, for example. So I think that the suggestion is, is if the patient is by ventricular heart, which is, thank goodness, majority of the congenital heart disease patients, uh, the management would be very similar of what any by ventricular heart uh, patient. If it's a single ventricle, I think it would be a completely different topic. Some patients, some centers might, might not even put ECMO on univentricular hearts. And when you choose to put an ECMO on ventricular heart, you have to choose uh, the, the cannulation very carefully and consideration of the anticoagulation and the high risk of clotting. And the only patients that might have might need a special attention are the patients that are cyanotic because they are they have a higher risk of clotting with, uh, with ECMO. I have seen patients just having disasters on ECMO with cyanosis. We still use uh, uh, ECMO in these patients if needed, but is that a group of patients that need to be more careful? Hey, I, I understand that. So basically, well, if the patient has a univentricular physiology and it's an adult, we will most likely know beforehand. Uh, and for all other patients, uh, you believe that we would not be surprised. So we should not include a congenital heart disease in the differentials when, for example, an ECMO uh, is not uh, oxygenating well or uh, there is non uh, proper functioning. Is that right? <laughs> The main problem that you may have is having a residual shunt. So, so that's when sometimes we are, you know, you, you might have somebody that is not oxygenated properly and have a residual shunt. That's that's the the first troubleshooting that you might want to might, you need to consider if somebody had a previous DSD closure or ASD closure. If you if things are not going in the right direction and, and if the, everything else is okay and you don't have any other explanation, the shunt sometimes are, of course, if you have an ASD and you're an ECMO uh, uh, or a residual ASD, you, are, you might have a, a desaturation. That's the main troubleshooting. I want to clarify, a patient with single ventricle is not a no. It just needs to be done in a center with expertise in congenital heart disease, but it's not a no. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, if, it's a patient that needs to be, if possible, and stable, either transfer uh, to a center with, with expertise of congenital heart disease or calling a center of congenital heart disease expertise for, to know how to cannulate. So sometimes we are on call and we get phone calls 
for another centers to cannulate patients with uh, with um, single ventricles and we I, if I'm on call, I don't say don't do it. And if the patient cannot come here, and it's, the gonna, it's the only solution. What we discuss how to cannulate and where. So, so I mean, I wouldn't be the first patient that is cannulated somewhere else in a center with a lot of experience on ECMO, but no experience with heart disease, and they manage to get the patient out of the woods and get the patient they cannulated and transfer the patient here after. So, so don't say single ventricles. No, it's single ventricle needs the the ideally an expertise in clinical heart disease and the others. If you have the saturation, the main thing is to rule out a, a shunt that you, you wouldn't have in a patient with non congenital heart disease in general. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I see there is someone else with the uh, hand raised. Um, I'm going to be jumping in. No, I think it was uh, Arnaud is still has his hands up, but okay. like, I think you can go ahead. Rafa. Yeah, uh, so um, this is related to a much uh, more uh, simple uh, congenital disease. It's a case that I did here in London a couple of weeks ago, and I'd like to hear uh, the opinion of you guys from uh, experts in congenital heart disease. So this is a 56 years old male uh, known to have a lifelong subaortic stenosis that presented uh, with progressive shortness of breath and chest tightness on exertion. He's also an elevated BMI, is Volker with a GERD and uh, sleep apnea. And he comes for a resection of a subaortic membrane. So he has uh, symptoms of aortic stenosis due to a congenital subaortic membrane. Uh, so these are the images uh, in the OR, and I hope that everybody can uh, appreciate a good temporal resolution here. Uh, so top left, uh, we can see that there is uh, something here in the LVOT, which is the non uh, subaortic membrane with flow acceleration and some uh, AI. Uh, the 3D, which is not stellar in this case, but uh, you can see that the subaortic membrane is here and also in a short axis and uh, zoomed into the LVOT, it's clear that there's something here. Um, this is just to show, this is a still image just to show that the flow acceleration and the aliasing, they start uh, uh, just uh, below the aortic valve compatible with the subaortic uh, stenosis. Um, this is a short axis of the aortic valve uh, showing um, some signs of uh, uh, calcification, maybe a commissure fusion here, which would be compared with a, a bicuspid-like aortic valve. There's probably some features of uh, dysplasic valve here as well, but uh, not sure. Uh, again, just a long axis dedicated here with color steel frame to show the acceleration before the LVOT. And then uh, deep transgastric uh, going from the apex towards the aortic valve, we start seeing uh, flow acceleration at some point close, but not at the level we see uh, uh, maximum velocity with pulse wave Doppler. And then we can only see uh, velocities across the LVOT with continuous wave Doppler without aliasing. And this is what some people would call the triple envelope sign. So you have one envelope here, a second envelope here, and a third envelope here. Um, some measurements here, but irrelevant for the case. And so we go on pump and the membrane is resected. Um, you can see here, uh, there are signs of uh, resection in the area where we previously saw the membrane. Um, we interrogated the interventricular septum and there was no signs of uh, VSDs, iatrogenic VSDs, but we still see that same valve which has some uh, regurgitation. We could say based on only on this view, it's a little bit in the mild, maybe mild to moderate side. Um, and here we see after the resection, this is a steel frame as well. There's no acceleration anymore and everything happens. Uh, the, the, the acceleration starts at the level of the valve. So the subaortic stenosis, it's gone apparently. Um, just to compare before and after with and without color. So you see a in here and you don't see it anymore here. Uh, so we believe that there is no flow acceleration anymore in, at the level of the LVOT. However, 
this aortic valve uh, post pump presents with a mean gradient with 20 of 21. I mean, it is a, a, a valve that we, as we saw, there is probably some fusion between the RCC and the LCC. Um, there's some calcifications there. And although this is a hyperdynamic state, uh, mean gradient of 21, we will be looking at mild to moderate aortic stenosis on a valve that's possibly bicuspid, which was confirmed by the surgeons under direct vision. So the surgeon, that's a question the surgeon uh, made at that time. And this is the question I bring to you. Uh, of course, there is no criteria to replace the valve in a patient with uh, mild to moderate uh, uh, AS. Uh, however, we have a 56 years old male with the chest open over the table. And uh, we, we know it's a bicuspid aortic valve with uh, gradients on the mild to moderate now. Should we leave the aortic valve alone or go back and replace the valve right now? So that's the question. Marcos, you want to take it or you want me to take it? Rafael, yeah, you can take it and we discuss it. Mean, I can, but I mean, that's, that's a very good question. I don't think you have a right or wrong answer here. I personally would not touch the valve. So it's a, it's a, a valve that uh, has a mind, probably AS, and uh, you might last, if you, if you just change the valve, you just, first of all, if, if the patient had been consented for that, but even let's say the patient had been consented for that, I, uh, I would probably wait until the until the patient uh, that valve gets deteriorated, and I would do a valve replacement later on. You don't know if that valve can last for another ten years. I ten years that uh, the patient gain on that valve, but I can understand why the question come. Some people might think differently, and uh, I'm quite conservative to not to change things that because we are there. So if that valve had not be, if the patient had that, only that a, a lesion with a mixed valve disease that is mild or mild to moderate with a normal ejection fraction, a normal ventricle, we would not offer him surgery. So I try not to um, to change the way I think in the OR. It's not because they damage the valve or just, just the valve was a living mask for the sap or the castanosis and now it's happened to have a, a mild uh, AS. So, but I personally would not, but this is uh, could be a matter of discussion. If somebody say yes, do it. I don't think it's understandable either. Yeah, can I say something? Yeah, I totally agree with Zafa. If we go by the guideline, this is not moderate AS. We know that if you have a moderate AS and we are in the war, we go for that aortic valve. This is mild to moderate or even less maybe. So, I, and the valve, I'm not sure really is a congenital bicuspid. Is I, I agree is a functional bicuspid by calcification, but even as a congenital, this valve might last uh, another five, six years. Uh, so there's no point to do a valve replacement now. We can do it later or we can do TAVI or something else. Yeah, I would leave it. Yeah, I, I agree, and uh, and also like um, like uh, thinking about the fellows that are watching the presentation is also important to to emphasize that it's always hard to make like uh, uh, this to to take decisions based on the hemodynamic hemodynamics uh, coming off bypass, and also one thing that Raphael showed us like after they remove the submembrane. Like it's also important to evaluate if there is some like a residual VSG or something right um, right at the site of the resection of the submembrane. So I wouldn't I wouldn't do anything else. I wouldn't change. I wouldn't tell the surgeon to go back and bypass and change the valve also. Yeah. No. Thank you very much. I appreciate the comments, and uh, that's exactly what happened. I I said the same. I said you know this adult he's young. He's here with the chest open. I would say that this is mild AS because now he's hyperdynamic in this same patient. Uh, so they didn't do anything with the valve. The patient uh, had a very good uh, post-op recovery. And uh, TTE three days uh, afterwards uh, uh, showed uh, uh, gradients still in the mild to moderate range. 
but uh, patients happy with the, the outcomes uh, right now and, and uh, we didn't do anything, we just left it alone. But thank you very much, I appreciate uh, all the comments. I think Fabio had a question as well. Do you, Fabio? Yes, uh, actually I do is, is also think about the fellows that are watching this presentation. Guys, um, I, know, uh, I noticed that like uh, the, um, at the beginning of the presentation, Marcos, you said you, you're not talking about uh, gradients and hemodynamics calculation, but just briefly, could you guys just touch base, in, um, touch base about, um, and talk a little bit really briefly about like the when and how, in which case, use like the QP, QS uh, measurements, the relation between them. So I think it's important to just re illustrate a little bit for the fellows that are watching this presentation. Thank you. Well, it's a great question and uh, one we talk about quite often. I'm going to direct uh, Ahmad, who, who teaches quite extensively on, um, on QP, QS relationships. So Ahmad, do you mind fielding this question? When do you think it's appropriate to do QPS, QS ratio to calculate shunt fractions and whatnot? Yeah, um, uh, if we wanna go based on transistic, probably maybe Rafael can talk about uh, calculation of the shunt by transistic because we cannot measure the pulmonary annulus very well. Maybe it's not very accurate, but in the OR, uh, I don't think calculation of the shunt pre-op has really a value. We, we, we can diagnose the disease and the size of the AST, VST, other things by just the TE. But the post-op is important because if we left a residual shunt and we want to make a decision, in that time we can use the calculation of the shunt either the, by the Doppler or maybe by the oxygen saturation. So I think the main use is uh, uh, post-op to see how much is, for example, residual AST or residual BST. I don't know, maybe refer to some other things, yeah. So, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of calculating shans with echo, <laughs> but uh, just because of what Ahmad just said, uh, the pulmonary annulus is extremely difficult to measure accurately, and uh, we should we would never make decisions clinically based on what echo, on a shant calculated by echo. It's very easy to underestimate or overestimate the shunt. So even T give you a better view of the of the off-road track then you really can measure better. But even though still you need to, to get the data that you get from a coin shunt calculation with a pinch of salt and need to mix, need to match the clinical situation you have in front of you. So we, in trans traffic, we don't use it at all. Then don't, we don't make any single decision and we don't calculate the shunt. Uh, uh, never, even a patient with severe ASDs or with, with large ASDs, just because of the of the risk of um, of uh, making a overestimating or underestimating the shunt. So, if you want to make a clinical decision on a, in a shunt patient, you have to cut the patient and get the saturations into the thick to calculate your shunts properly. The the echo you can use the echo for indirect signs of. If the patient has pulmonary hypertension or, or, or the shunt might not be closable, but in terms of calculating the shunt, the echo has the limitation that the, the afrotrat are difficult to measure with the trans traffic at least. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Rafael, looks like you have someone else asking, wants to ask for a question. Hansa, thank you. Go ahead. You have a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thanks, Rafael, for the interesting case. I was wondering if it's another case and what do i mean by that if it was a cabbage involving uh lima or reed or, or uh, lima or rima would you do anything different would you suggest uh, or discuss it furthermore in changing the valve you mean without the subaortic membrane Yes. Just, just uh, mild. No, I don't think there is any indication to uh, replace the valve if there is a, a mild to moderate AS. Uh, I, um, I, I would like to hear other people's opinion, but uh, only if it's moderate. I don't think uh, mild to moderate it's an indication. Mm, yeah. Again, the guideline says moderate. Yeah. If you have a moderate AS and you are going for to the OR for other cardiac surgery is better to replace it, but this is not the moderate, yeah.
Excellent. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Rafael, there's question, yeah, there is. Yeah, there's yeah. a question in the chat uh, yeah. asking. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, would appreciate a device regarding the incidental ASD finding intraoperatively. It's a good question. So, so just to clarify, you're talking about uh, like a, a secondum ASD, and you don't know whether or not to tell the surgeons to replace to to repair. Yeah, how would you decide to tell the surgeon to repair or not? Um, I don't remember, I don't recall correctly, but uh, we had a case here a few years ago that the patient came for an elective cabbage and it was found to have an ASD. I don't remember what happened exactly, but uh, it's a good opportunity to, to hear your opinion. Uh, you're going for an elective surgery and then all of a sudden you find, let's say, a second ASD. So I think in, in uh, the experience of the cases that we've had in the last couple of months, I think it depends on one, the size of the ASD, two, the direction of the shunt, and then three, what the intervention that they're going in for. Or is it, is it a cabbage or is it something intracardiac or they're doing something where they have to open the right atrium or left atrium? Um, that, that's the kind of the three main things that I can think of that will influence decision-making. Ahmad, do you have any uh, additional input? Uh, if by definition we call it ASD, it means the defect at least more than one centimeter, I think we are in the war, we should close it. I, I believe this way. But if we are going to talk about less than one centimeter, something like a PFO a slash ASD, and we are not opening the LA or RA, uh, we are doing just a simple cabbage, we might leave it and we might dec decide about that uh, percutaneously. I don't know, maybe Rafael has something else. Yeah. Um, can I just add something else for this uh, to this question? Let's say it's a iatrogenic ASG called, for example, patient have a mitral clip, for example, and when they finish everything, they, they see like there is an iatrogenic ASG so, which is like, um, would be the same approach in terms of like a decision making, or should you just close it right away? What did you guys think? So, I mean, you are in the cat lab doing mitral clip and you create AST yourself for crossing that the catheter? Yes. No, we don't close that one because most of the time that, that defect by catheter is the size will decrease and might totally resolve in future. So we don't do anything for that one. This is the same for uh, a mitral balloon, for example, in all time, uh, we were doing mitral balloon, uh, mm -hmm. septostomy, uh, we leave them and many of them, they, they, they close their self. We see them later, it's not there anymore. No, we don't close them. Okay, thank you. I can also tell you, we've gotten this, we've gotten this wrong before in that uh, there's been patients that have gone to the OR, there was some intra-atrial shunt that was detected and uh, wasn't closed at the time of surgery. And then the patient had issues with elevated pulmonary pressures, for instance, or, or the shunt became a right to left shunt with chronic hypoxemia that required percutaneous closure afterwards. So that, that's also happened. So it's always gonna be a judgment call, but uh, you know, Every, all the different outcomes are, are possible. You just try to make the decision that you think is best. But you know, as the clinical uh, condition evolves over the, the subsequent days, things can change. Thank you, guys. Excellent. I think it was a good discussion today. Uh, it's almost 10 past six. Anyone has any other questions? All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining today. And thanks uh, for all that participated in the uh, discussions. Uh, our next session is supposed to be on March 21st. And Rob Chen from Ottawa will be uh, talking about the astrology. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you, Thank you okay. guys.